Once again, we have another update for Tiny Eye. If this is your first time hearing of it, Tiny Eye 1.3 is a free, fully procedural, stylized eye that works in both EV and cycles. I made this eye with the intent of keeping the properties minimal and straightforward, but it has come to a point where I'd find myself diving into the note group to make minor changes, and that kind of defeats the ultimate purpose of Tiny Eye, which is to speed up my workflow. So I will address in this video the changes that I've made to not only mitigate this issue, but also the many other new features that come with this update. There's a lot to cover in this video, so feel free to skip to any of the chapters that are relevant to you. One of the big updates for Tiny Eye 1.3 is that we now have an add-on that mirrors the entire asset browser collection in the add menu. So if you don't wish to install the asset browser and don't mind browsing through the teeny tiny thumbnails, then this add-on is for you. The asset browser comes with a library of presets to get inspired by and to use as a starting point, and since it's procedural, the possibilities are pretty much endless. And that means the library only gets bigger from here. We have one new category, so we now have a total of five, default with three different starting points, one for each category, stylized with cleaner stylized features, realistic with more lifelike features, simple which you can take it as like a bare bones version of realistic, animals like cats, dragons or reptiles, and goats. Here are all the properties you need to know about Tiny Eye. There are three groups of properties to look at, the shape keys, the iris shader, and the sclera shader. Firstly, we have shape keys to adjust the iris, pupil, and the cornea. For the cornea, we have bulge, so zero for a no bulge, which is perfect for a spherical stylized eyes, and one for a realistic cornea bulge. For the iris, they now have been standardized to start at a realistic size, so now you can choose to either grow or shrink them. You can give it an oval shape for anime eyes, or even make it square for whatever reason. For the pupil, you can choose to dilate or constrict it, and now we have six different shapes for you to use them, or even to mix them up. Next, we have the revamped iris and sclera shaders. Tiny eye will now come in two different versions, 3.0 and 4.0. Now, before I dive deep into the new shader properties, let me first address the differences between the two. In general, you only get these pop-up descriptions in 4.0. Blender just doesn't offer this function in the 3.0 line. The main difference you'll find falls in the iris shader. The new sclera shader are exactly the same in both versions. In 4.0, you'll see that we have these properties up here that aren't collapsed. These are the main properties that you would normally reach out for. You can then expand the collapse panels for the additional functions. Now, if you expand these panels, panels and compare the two iris shaders, you'll see that they're exactly the same, just without the ability to collapse the additional functions in 3.0. The last difference you'll find is that in 4.0, you have a checkbox to toggle the emission on and off, whereas in 3.0, it's a 0 or 1 slider. Oh yeah, we have emission now. For this demo, I'm going to showcase the shader properties in Blender 4.0. Now let's take a look at the new 1.3 iris shader. You can access them either by the material properties or the shader editor. Let's first run through the properties that aren't collapsed. As always, I've arranged them to be tweaked from the top to the bottom. The color input determines the color of the iris. I recommend keeping the luminance value low to avoid overexposure and to achieve richer colors. Ciliary zone introduces ciliary zone details such as the color Colorette, Crips, and its own radial streaks. You can now independently scale the ciliary zone and the streaks. The contrast slider accounts for the entire iris. Now, before I talk about extra height, let's first take a look at the realistic and stylized sliders. So, you get to pick between realistic streaks and stylized streaks, or both. And these sliders just determine the strength of the streaks. Now, what this extra height slider is, is that it emulates the height of the streaks. So, it's kind of like a fancier strength slider. Randomize randomizes the iris details. By the way, I snuck in a fun little driver code that gives an ever-evolving stop-motion effect. Now let's open up the collapse panels and take a look at the additional functions. In the ciliary zone panel, you can adjust the hue, saturation, and value, giving the ciliary a whole new color. And probably one of my favorite new properties is the gradient slider. So instead of having two drastically different colors, you can now fade between them and determine the amount of gradient you need. In the ciliary edge panel, you can introduce a border that overlaps the crypts. This not only allows you to better replicate a wider variety of eye patterns, but also gives you the ability to change the hue for an additional gradient effect. In the Crips panel, you can change the opacity of the Crips and the Colorette. You can also shrink and stretch the Crips. In the Colorette panel, you can feather out the Colorette or give it some additional emulated height. In the Pupil panel, you can now, for whatever reason, change the color of it. This very evidently reveals a flaw of the eye model. I honestly did not anticipate this feature, but assuming that it's for stylization, I recommend turning on the emission, especially for brighter colors. You can now also feather the 
edges of the pupil. In the dark ring panel, you can determine the radius of the dark ring or limbal ring, same thing. You can also adjust the feather and opacity. In the miscellaneous panel, you can emulate the top shadow casted by the upper eyelid. You can give the bottom portion of the iris some glow for that nice stylized gradient. This works really nicely on darker eyes. I recommend keeping this value low for brighter eye colors. You can also change the hue and saturation of the bottom glow. Lastly, in the emission panel, you can finally toggle on and off the emission for both the iris and the pupil independently, and also adjust their strengths. Just for info, it goes beyond 10. Next up, in the second slot, we have the new 1.3 Sclera shader. And as you can see, there are no collapse panels. In the Sclera portion, color and specular do exactly what you expect them to do. Although in 3.0, this specular slider only affects the Sclera due to shader limitations. You can change the roughness of the cornea and the Sclera independently. In the cornea portion, you can soften the edges of the cornea and even give it a random funky shape. In the shadow portion, you can now change the color of the fake shadow, determine how soft you want it to be, and change its opacity. The blood portion is pretty much the same as the shadow portion, just red. Lastly, the veins portion, you can finally change the color of the veins. You can also scale it up for larger creatures, adjust its opacity, increase the height of the veins, and randomize it. Now, by default, the height slider is unplugged for better performance. So to get it to work, dive into the node group and just plug this in. Keep in mind that this may cause some lag, especially when viewing it up close. Alright, so that's all you need to know about the properties of TinyEye 1.3. Now let me show you how to set it up. For the add-on, once you've downloaded the file on my Gumroad, go to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, hit install and install the zip file. Search up tiny eye and check the box. And now if you hit shift A, it should appear in your add menu. As for the asset browser, once you've downloaded the file on my Gumroad, unzip the folder, then save it to your desired location. Then go to edit, preferences, file paths, then under asset libraries, hit the plus icon and locate the folder tinyeye 1.3 asset browser. Once you click into it, you'll see an empty folder, but don't panic, that's just the way it is. Hit add asset library, then make sure to save preferences, then drag up a new window, change it to asset browser, and look for tinyeye 1.3. If you don't see the eyes, just hit refresh and it should all appear. Drag and drop it into the viewport and then hit alt G to reset the location. Now, this is where a lot of people get confused. I don't see the f***ing eye, where the f*** is it? If you see tiny eye in the outliner, it's there, it's just really, really small. Just click on the eyeball in the outliner, then in the viewport, press frame selected, either by numpad period or tilde 3. I promise you this was modeled according to scale, I didn't make it small to piss you off, also I didn't make it small because I named it tiny eye, like, come on. Here are some of the common problems I found many of you faced in the comments section of the previous video. If you're having trouble downloading tiny eye on Gumroad, under name a fair price, type in zero and add to cart, then accept the license agreement and hit get. Before you diagnose any problems, check to see that you're using the right Blender version. You can pause the video if you need to. Now, if the cornea is appearing as this glossy, opaque texture in the material preview, go to render properties and set the render engine to EV, turn on screen space reflections and refraction. Next, in cycles, some of you may get this blacked out cornea effect. Chances are you have your transmission light path turned down too low, so go to render properties, light paths, max bounces, and turn up transmission. Now, I'm gonna bring in this glass pane and look at what happens. It turned black again. Now watch what happens as I turn up the transmission light path one at a time. You'll see that the iris begins to appear at 3. So what happens if we bring in another glass pane? It turns black again. So let's turn up the transmission again, then DJ Khaled this sh Okay, I'm sure you get my point. The more glass material you overlap in your scene, the more light paths you will need to rectify this phenomenon. Next, if you tried applying a mirror modifier, you'd realize that you can't. That's because Tiny Eye has shape keys. So one way to fix this problem is by applying all the shape keys. That will get it to work, but let's just say you don't want to lose them. Well, my current solution is to delete the mirror modifier, Shift D and give the X location the opposite number. Either remove the negative or edit. This is of course assuming that your front is the Y axis. If you want the shape keys of both eyes to correspond with one another, duplicate using Alt D instead. Or select both the eyeball and hit Ctrl L then link object data. Now this portion is for those of you that are newer to Blender. Some of you might wonder why there aren't any textures. If you look at these little sphere icons up here, it's likely that you're in solid mode. You want to click on material preview to see the textures. 
this. Now, if you click on the fourth button and you have no idea why everything turns gray, just follow this next part. To really bring out the potential of Tiny Eye, I suggest throwing on a HDRI for it to catch reflections. The tool that I'm using right now is the Polyhaven Asset Browser. It's one of those add-ons that I now can't live without. I mean, just look at how quickly I'm swapping out these HDRIs. It is a paid add-on that you can either get on your Patreon or Blender Market. But in case you didn't already know, every single one of their assets are free on their website. Not just free, but CC0 free. If you don't know how to set up a HDRI, here's how you do it. Go to the Polyhaven website and download any one of the HDRIs. I'm going to download this one in 1K HDR. Now in Blender, I'm going to drag up this timeline and change it to the shader editor. Change object to world. Now click on the background node and hit Control T. If nothing is showing up, make sure you go to edit preferences, add-ons, search for a node wrangler and enable it. Now click on the background node and hit Control T and this should show up. Hit open, then just look for the HDRI you just downloaded and hit open image. And that's it. You can rotate the Z-axis under rotation to reposition the HDRI. If you have cycles enabled and want to see the HDRI in the material preview, just click on this drop down arrow and select scene world. Now the feature that many of you have been asking for baking. I'll be showing you how to do two things. One, how to bake the textures, and two, how to set it up. In Blender, of course. So I'm going to be baking the zombie eye for this demo. The first thing we're going to do is to set up one image texture in the iris shader and four image textures in the sclera shader. Then we're going to hop back in the iris shader and click on new. Give it a name. I'm going to call this tiny eye demo underscore iris underscore col for color underscore 2k. So since we're doing 2k, let's multiply these by two. Hit OK, then copy the name and hop over to the Sclera shader. Click on New, paste the name, then we're going to change Iris to Sclera. Let's change COL to NRM as well to follow the arrangement of the output sockets. So when it comes to baking a normal map, you want to set the color space to non-color. For this image texture, we're going to use the same name, just COL for color. And for the next one, we're going to call it Rough for roughness. And let's set the color space to non-color. Lastly, let's call this one Transmission and set the color space to non-color as well. So we should end up with five image textures with these settings. Now that we're done with the image texture setup, let's go ahead and make our own little baking station. So let's go ahead and split this window in a half, then split it in a half again, and this in a half as well. For this window under render properties, let's make sure that we're in cycles, and then let's look for the bake button, and these are the only settings that we have to see. Now for this window, we're going to look for the UV maps under object data properties. For the last window, let's pick image editor. So just to navigate you around a little bit. The bake button is obviously for baking the textures. The UV maps are so that we can select in the correct UV maps to bake on and the image editor is so that we can save our textures. So let's start baking. The first thing you want to do is to make sure that you have the eyeball selected and since we're going to bake the sclera, let's click on bake sclera under UV maps. Then let's change the bake type to normal and click on the normal image texture and check that you have the correct output socket plugged into the material output. For normals, we're going to plug it into the BSDF socket. Make sure that this is selected and hit bake. Alright, we're done. So if this didn't work for you, you probably missed one of the steps. So rewind the video and watch it again. You're going to see this asterisk beside image. Click on that and save as. I'm going to save it in this demo folder. Then save as image. Now that we have our normal map baked, we can now change the bake type to emit and not have to touch it for the rest of this process. Now to bake the color pass, let's hit Ctrl T on the shader node. Make sure that the eyeball is selected. Select the COL image texture. Make sure that we're still on bake sclera and hit bake. Once you're done, don't forget to save the texture. All we have to do now is to just repeat this process for the rest of the passes. Again, if it's not working for you, you probably missed one of the steps, so just rewind the video and just follow exactly what I do. Now, if it worked for you and you plug into the image texture, it would appear a little weird. All we have to do is create a UV map node and select Bake Sclera, then plug it into the vector sockets and it should work. Now that we have all the Sclera textures baked nicely, let's hop over to the iris shader and do the same thing. So let's control T on the iris shader and this time let's pick bake iris. Make sure that we have the image texture and the eyeball selected then hit bake. Now if this happens to you where your sclera texture turns black, just pray that you have saved your textures. If you're a smarty pants and you did, just click on image and click on reload. Now let's search for the iris texture that we just baked and save it. 
Now let's create a UV map node and select Big Iris, then connect it to the vector socket. I'm going to plug into the procedural shader just to show you that it works, and it does. If you didn't have the correct UVs connected to the iris shader, this is what it'll look like. Now that we have our textures baked, let's go ahead and set them up. Let's first take away all of these windows, we don't need them anymore. Then let's hop over to the sclera shader and delete the procedural shader. And let's throw in a principled BSDF and let's delete the textures as well for this demo. With the principled BSDF selected, hit Control shift t then select all of the sclera textures and hit principled texture setup. Let's delete the mapping nodes and this frame. Then again, let's throw in a UV map node and select big sclera, then connect it to the vector socket. In the iris shader, once again, I'm going to delete everything for this demo. Then let's add in a principled BSDF and again hit Control shift t Double click on the iris texture. Then we can delete the principled BSDF since it was just a way to quickly import the iris texture. Then let's throw in a diffuse shader and connect color to color. Delete the mapping nodes and add in a UV map node and select big iris. Connect it to the vector socket and we're done. But if you want to take it a step further, we can add in an emission node and a mix shader node. Diffuse goes into the first socket, emission goes into the second. Connect the color of the image texture to the color of the emission node, then choose between 0 or 1, none of that 0 0.5 thing. 0 means diffuse, 1 means emission. Then you can adjust the strength according to your needs. That's it. Now, since Blender is all I use, I would have to leave it to you guys, the community, to try and set up TinyEye in your respective softwares. If I find any videos successfully demonstrating just that, I'll link it in a pinned comment down below. Since we're on the topic of baking textures, I have a little announcement to make. I'm opening a Patreon page. If you subscribe to any of the tiers, you'll receive the baked version of the entire Tiny Eye collection. It'll come in both the asset browser and the add-on. On top of that, you'll receive early access to at least one preset a month. There's also a sponsor tier where if you become a sponsor, you get to pick an eyeball each month to have your name tagged to permanently. So if you wish to support my works and this channel, this would be a fantastic way to do so. To read the other benefits, you can head over to my Patreon, link in the description. And if you do end up subscribing, I'd really like to thank you for support and I'll see you there. Another question I get a lot is how to rig tiny eye. There are a lot of rigs out there in the market so there probably isn't just one way to go about this but the bottom line is that you need to have the root of the eye bone to be in the exact same position as the origin point of the eye. So for this demo I'm going to be using the rigify add-on. If you don't have it turned on it comes with blender just search up rigify in the add-ons tab and just hit the checkbox. The first thing we want to do is to have the cursor snap to the origin point of the eye so select the eye and hit shift s cursor to select it then i'm gonna hide the eyes select the rig go into edit mode and select the root of the eye bone turn on the symmetry and then hit shift s and this time we're going to use selection to cursor select the meta rig and for this demo i'm going to upgrade the face rig once that's done let's generate the rig and let's hide this meta rig select the generated rig scroll all the way down and you'll see three hidden bones original bones mechanism or mechanical helper bones and deformation bones so you can parent the eye to either the mechanism or deformation eye bone for this case i'm using mechanism in blender 3.6 and before the mechanism bone can be found in this little bubble here let's unhide mechanical bone I'm going to hide the eye again and let's select on the bone, hit tab and select MCH. I.L. Go back to object mode and unhide the eye. Let's hide the meta rig. Now select the eye, then select the rig. Control tab to go into post mode. Let's go into solid mode and turn on the x ray. Make sure that the eyeball and the bone are selected. Then hit control P and set parent to bone. And that's it. Just do the same thing on the other eye and you're set. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this update and I can't wait to see what you guys do with it. In fact, if you do end up using tiny eye in your works, feel free to tag me on Instagram or Twitter or just use the hashtag tiny eye b 3D. If you still have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments section or just check the pinned comment to see if someone already beat you to it. Also, I've created a tiny eye support channel on Discord, so feel free to pop by and see if your questions have already been answered. Anyway, thank you all so much for 121,000. Hey! Thank you all so much for 156,000 subscribers on YouTube. Consider leaving a like and maybe even subscribe. And watch this video next to see me sculpt 100 heads to find out how much I can improve. The comment section is quite a a fun read. Okay, bye guys.